Welcome to the online service and Happy Christmas! It's so good to have you with us today. This is a day of special celebration throughout the Western world. It's the day when everybody is focused on the birth of Jesus and all the events that surrounded it. So we too are going to celebrate the birth of Jesus here today. Today we're going to celebrate communion together at the end of the service, so get ready. And also we're going to sing and celebrate his birth. So let's start together now singing some very familiar songs.
This is the time of the service where we reach out to God. As we know, Christmas is a time of great joy and celebration, but also for others, it contains some sadness. And we certainly don't ignore what people are going through. So let's reach out to God right now. We're going to pray for each other. We're going to pray for you. Receive what God has for you today and receive the special joy for this celebratory time of year. Mm -hmm. Father, we pray today for all those viewers and those watching or listening to this message. And we're asking, Father, that you would bring on them right now the supernatural glory of God, like what shone around the shepherds when you announced the birth of Jesus. Father, I pray for those going through a tough time, those that have lost loved ones. Father, I pray that you would give them a real peace. I thank you that you are with them, that you are the comforter. Give them comfort and peace in Jesus' name. I'm praying for somebody today and your hand is very sore. Your wrist has been really snapped really hard in some particular area. It's not feeling right. So in the name of Jesus, we claim a rapid and complete recovery for that risk and the way it was twisted and damaged back. Mm -hmm. We claim all the tendons and all the ligaments to be healed, to be put back into place. The strain and the stress there completely healed in Jesus' name. I'm praying for somebody today too. You've been experiencing frequent headaches. Somebody says to you, it's the glasses. You have to change your glasses. It's eye strain. But I'm saying to you right now, it's not from God. And God is saying, if you will look to me and bring this problem to me right now and trust me with it, I'll bring healing to you that nobody else can bring. So open your heart to him right now. Mm -hmm. Place your hand over your eyes and over your head. And in Jesus name, we claim complete healing from these frequent headaches in Jesus' name. Yes, we pray for all those that have been experiencing headaches. We stand against the stress. We stand against every work of the enemy that's bringing on these, these headaches. And we thank you, Lord, that by your stripes they were healed. And we declare that healing in Jesus' name. Now, somebody has a very hurt muscle or pulled muscle, strained muscle in the back of your leg going right up into your hip area. And in the name of Jesus, we claim healing over that right now. That news might have been a bit sudden for you. You weren't expecting me to pray for it, but God is guiding us. And he says, today is your day. Receive that healing, place your hand there. And when you finish receiving, then start to exercise it by faith. Get up out of your chair, walk around claiming, shouting and, and declaring, I'm healed in the name of Jesus because the power of God's on you right now to affect that healing in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Father, I pray for a heart issue. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen that problem in the heart in the name of Jesus. Heart, be healed. Be strengthened in Jesus' name. And I'm just feeling from God right now, He's impressing me to encourage every one of us to take more seriously divine healing. Because we live in times when the pressure is high, people are dying, and it's time for us to really take seriously standing on the promises of God mm -hmm. and believing for healing every day of our lives, that by His stripes we were healed. He renews our youth like the eagles. Receive the healing, receive the glory, the goodness of God, and the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead quickens your mortal body. We need to stand on these promises and all the other healing scriptures in Jesus' mighty name. Yeah. Also, we need to stand on the scripture that my God shall supply all of my needs. Some people at this time feel a little bit of stress and financially just believe God that he will provide your every need. Amen. So good. Mm -hmm. And today, as we're thinking about Jesus' birth, yeah. just lift your hands to God and receive from him right now. Receive his joy his anointing. Thank you. He's given you new birth for a purpose. You have a call and a gift from God. You have some assignment that he wants you to fulfill mm -hmm. and receive his wisdom right now in Jesus name. And as we move on with this service, open your heart to him and receive what he has for you this day in preparation for a new year in God.
is Christmas. It's a time for fun, food, family, fellowship, <laughs> and friends. It's Christmas time. We have come to celebrate and sing. It's Christmas time. Let the earth receive a king. For some, it's filled with expectation, but for some, it holds some painful memories. I pray for those that are having a difficult time for God to strengthen you and to give you peace in these challenging times. I do hope that in this holiday season, you will have time to reflect, that you will be refreshed and then re-inspired. I pray this season will be filled with wonderful surprises and blessings. hope arise where it has faded. Let joy arise where it has been jaded. Let the peace of God, which passes all understanding, fill your heart anew. Christ is alive. He is truly the light of the world and it is His birth that we are celebrating this season. But for some when they see the decorations appear once again in all their colour and magnificence, there's a deep longing on the inside for some sense of meaning of it all, some sense of purpose because there's more to life. If you don't live with the awareness that God is the creator, the sustainer of everything, the one true God who loves you with an everlasting love, then you will end up going the wrong way and life just does not make sense. Our God created the universe at the stars and moon in place. Our God created the universe, every galaxy in space. He set the cosmos into The most important thing in life is what you believe. There are so many lies out there that try to distract us from the true meaning of life. Life is not based on accumulating possessions or worldly success, personal satisfaction. We live in a world surrounded with the lies that life is just random, truth is relative, People are basically good. It's all about what you possess and what you achieve with your own efforts. The truth is that we are built to live in relationship with our Creator. Only God can forgive your sins and wrongdoing and give you the gift of salvation. Only if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ will you have eternal life. When you live your life to honour Him, you enjoy life to its max. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the good news. This is why Christmas is such an incredible event. 
the message of Christmas is the message of hope, forgiveness, salvation and eternal life with Jesus Christ. We were created for purpose, even in the disappointing circumstances of life. Sometimes we find purpose immediately and sometimes we find it eventually and sometimes we don't seem to find it at all. Sometimes we hope that God will answer in particular ways, but our trust and faith in Him is never in vain. Our faith has to be in Jesus who came into this world like each of us to be one of us to save all of us.
Christmas, part four, God's signs and symbols. Today we're looking at this in three sections. Number one, signs and symbols at the birth of Jesus. Number two, signs and symbols in the life and ministry of Jesus. And number three, signs and symbols for us today. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word, we're asking for you to move supernaturally in our lives and to bring to pass your will, your wisdom, your revelation for us, opening the eyes of our understanding that we could understand what you've written and what you say. And Lord, also the grace to be able to apply it in and through our lives today in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, today we're basing this on Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 12, then verses 15 to 18. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Saviour, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognise him by this sign. You'll find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Verse 15. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in a manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. I remember Christmas when I was growing up. By the time I was a teenager, we were living on the farm and every year, through wise management of finances, mum would be able to scrape together the money for an amazing Christmas. We all received lots of gifts and the Christmas banquet she put on was awesome. We always had some turkey or chicken or something like that. We had so much dessert and main course and there would be shortbread and Christmas cake and Christmas pudding. It was a magnificent banquet. Kind of continued on Christmas night, continued on Boxing Day with all the leftovers and more turkey, more shortbread. It was a magnificent banquet. But you know, by the day after Boxing Day, I would regularly come in and say to my mum, Mum, I'm starving. Of course, she didn't appreciate that because without me realising it, starving meant you never had enough to eat. But in my case, I was simply hungry. The problem was that my stomach had a very bad memory. And even though it ate a banquet one day, it wasn't permanently satisfied and always craved more in a very short space of time. And spiritually, we're exactly like that. The Bible describes an inner cavity inside our spiritual being that will drive us like hunger and thirst does, but it can only be satisfied in one way. The world has lots of counterfeits to satisfy it, but none of them last any longer than Christmas dinner does. None of them are truly satisfying, and they all just run out over time. So let's look at this today in detail. What can we learn from God's signs and symbols, especially about eternal fulfillment? Number one, it's the signs and symbols at Jesus' birth. You see, God gave the sign of a baby in a manger to confirm the birth of a saviour who is Christ the Lord. Luke 2:12, then 16 to 18. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. And there was the baby lying in the manger. And that's after they got to Bethlehem, obviously. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But you see, it wasn't just any baby. This was a Saviour who is Christ the Lord, as we see in Luke 2.11. For there's born to you this day in the city of David a Saviour who is Christ the Lord. So God had signs at the birth of Jesus, signs to shepherds, the true shepherds. But 
Jesus was a symbol as well and is placed in a symbolic object, in a symbolic place, in a symbolic town. Let's look at this. So Jesus, as we know, was born in the city of Bethlehem, which means bread house. And later Jesus reveals that he's the bread of life. So the bread of life is birthed in the bread house. Amen. And then Luke 2.16 says, Shepherds hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. So the manger is indeed a feeding trough for animals, namely the flock. So the bread of life, which Jesus is, is being made available for God's flock and placed in a special place, the bread house. I suppose that could symbolize a church too. And it's where people come to feed on the living manna. Amen. And of course, you can feed at church, but you can feed at home. You can feed on the word of God over the internet and in so many ways. Amen. And Jesus, of course, was born and placed in the manger where maybe one of these sacrificial lambs was born. They're looking for one with no blemish so it can be used for sacrifice. And again, Jesus, the one destined to be the sacrifice for man's sins from before the foundation of the world, was lying there in a symbolic place. Amen. So you've got God's sacrifice, the living bread that came down from heaven, spiritual food, all in this feeding trough and the place where sacrificial lambs were placed. Such an amazing story. What an amazing symbol and sign God had for us through the birth of Jesus. Number two today is signs and symbols in Jesus' ministry. During Jesus' ministry, especially as noted in the book of John, he did seven very important signs. They're listed as signs. So let's look at this sign of bread multiplication. In John chapter 6, verse 4 to 14. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Obviously, Passover is where they sacrifice the lamb, but they also ate the bread without leaven in it, without yeast in it, symbolizing pure, no sin. It's a symbol of no sin and that Jesus is the bread of life. Very powerful symbolism. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who came into the world. Now you go a little bit further down in John chapter 6. They ended up at Capernaum and those people who were absolutely satiated by the magnificent feast Jesus made for them of bread and fish, by the next day were hungry again. And so there was a discussion that came out of this between Jesus and these people. And Jesus kept saying, it's not the manna from heaven that's even exciting. It's the true bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread won't get hungry again. And these guys are probably thinking, what? He's got bread, then we'll never get hungry again. You mean we won't have to plow? We won't have to reap? We won't have to thresh? We won't have to grind the grain, knead, cook it, do all of that work to get bread and only have to eat it and get hungry again, eat it, get hungry again, sow some more next year, reap it, grind it, thresh it, cook it, do it again, same thing next year, get the olives out of the tree, get the oil, get the yeast. Their process was never ending because they were living under the curse that came when Adam and Eve sinned, where God said to Adam, by the sweat of your brow, you'll have to work to eat your food. And so when Jesus said, if you eat the bread that I give, you won't get hungry. They're going, Jesus, give us this bread. We want that because we've had enough of this toil. Now, their motives may have been wrong, but they knew that Jesus had promised them bread, when you eat, you don't get hungry again. As I said, there's this hollow part inside people that drives them. And it drives every one of us, just like a hungry mouth, drove those people for planting, for reaping, for threshing and harvesting and grinding and cooking. Amen. 
and for beating out the olives and grinding them up as well and making wine by picking grapes and growing grapes and trampling the grapes, making them into juice. Jesus is telling us that that kind of natural food doesn't satisfy. And it's a picture of spiritually the empty part in us is created by God. The book of Ecclesiastes says we all have eternity within us. We need that eternal empty spot filled up. And Jesus begins to explain how this happens spiritually, but not physically like they were asking. Amen. So in John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Wow. Jesus is the bread of life. And he's starting to say, if you can work out what it means to eat what I'm offering and to drink what I'm giving, you can be fully satisfied all the time. And if you keep this up, you can be fully satisfied for eternity and not having that emptiness, that drivenness inside. You know, I always feel for the cricket team. The day of filming is Tuesday and we know that Australia beat South Africa in the cricket and they could probably celebrate that for a day or so, but then they had to go out there and do it again. There's something inside them and all their spectators that drives them to be the greatest trying to fill up this gnawing, empty space inside But even when they win, it's only short-lived because they have to do it again. And even if they win this whole series, they're going to have to face them again. They're going to have to face England, New Zealand, Bangladesh. They're going to have to face Sri Lanka and India. They're going to have to face other cricket-playing countries over and over again, whether it's a football, the cricket, the tennis, even if it's in a whole lot of other areas, the smartest, the best singer, the best looking, everybody's climbing somewhere, trying to find a place of significance in life where finally that thing inside will be satisfied, but it never lasts. Only Jesus can satisfy that empty spot that God created. You see, when I was younger, before I really knew what it was to be able to eat from Jesus and drink from Jesus, I would get that empty spot inside and it would drive me. And I remember as a young boy, I'd go to my mum and say, Mum, I want something. And she'd say to me, what do you want? I said, I don't know. I just want something. And she'd say, here, have a banana. That's the same shape and size as your stomach, which of course confused me even more because I knew it'd chew it up and I knew it wouldn't be the same shape anymore, even though it might be the same size. And I'd eat a banana and it wouldn't help. I'd drink a cuppa. That wouldn't help. There was something missing. But thank God I found it now. It's found in Jesus. The one from the feeding trough for animals. The one born in God's bread house. Amen. The one who can multiply bread and fish as a symbol of what he provides. Let's read on. And Jesus said this. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. So it's he who believes. You've got to believe. And we know that faith comes by hearing the word of God, according to Romans 10, 17. Excitingly, this reminds us that the way to receive something that's satisfied is through faith And it comes through the word of God. Jesus is the living word. So we have to come to him and eat that living word. That means we need to break through to him every day, deny the flesh, put off the old man, come with humility and honesty to Jesus. Remember, he said, I stand at the door and knock. He's knocking. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, boom, I'm in. And we sup together. He provides living bread for us. Manna in the wilderness was a symbol. Jesus multiplying bread and fish is a symbol. Jesus born in a manger is a symbol. But what it symbolizes is us coming to Jesus, the resurrected Lord and Savior and Christ and receiving living word from him 
every day as we listen to his voice, drinking him in. That's why he said you'll never be thirsty because you can drink him in. Jesus said the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. This is pictured in the book of Revelation in chapter 22, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb. There's the origin of this life. In John chapter 4, verses 13 to 14, Jesus was talking to the woman at the well of Samaria. And he was talking to her about a drink of water. She thought he's talking about the water from the well. He went on to clarify and he said, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up to eternal or everlasting life. Jesus' message about eating and drinking his flesh might be hard to swallow, (laughs) but this is what he's talking about, eating the living word and the life that comes when we hear from him is a flow of living water if we keep eating, if we keep hearing him, if we keep hearing him every day, It will be an eternal flow. Amen. You see, when Adam and Eve got cut off from that life, God said they would die. It took some time. But because there was no new life coming in, eventually the darkness of death takes over from the light of life. Amen. So Jesus' message about eating his flesh and drinking his blood is hard to swallow. Let's read John 6, 53 to 56. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. They're talking about bread that was multiplied in the wilderness. Now he's talking about eating his body and drinking his blood. They were getting more confused by the second because they weren't listening with spiritual ears. Jesus said, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Amen. It says that in Revelation. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. There's the clue in the last sentence. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. If you go backwards, if you abide in Jesus, you're abiding in him. You're living in the secret place. Remember, he abides in the secret place. Psalm 91. If you abide in that place and you are constantly supping, dining, fellowshipping with him, eating his words in, drinking in Jesus, what he stands for in his spirit. Amen. We've all been given one spirit to drink. The Bible says, We can drink in his spirit, take in who he is, take him on board. And remember, when we eat the communion emblems, we're looking at Jesus who was crucified. His body was broken and whipped and beaten and he shed his blood. We partake of that same attitude. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Although he was in the form of God, yet he didn't think, Equality with God was something that he should grasp onto, but he let it go. And coming in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and he was obedient to the point of death, even to the point where he obeyed his father to go into the cross and die. This is the attitude that we're drinking in when we drink in Jesus. We're taking on his spirit, his attitude, his heart, his desire to serve his father's vision. And we're eating his broken body, which represents the word being broken open to us in Revelation. When you receive all of that, life comes. It flows, it bubbles up to eternal life. And then out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. You'll be just like Jesus. Amen. John chapter 6, verses 31 to 35. After all, 
Our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, my father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. It's me, he's saying, it's me. I'm the resurrection and the life, he said. I'm the bread of life. You can have that bread every day, all day. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Speaking of that spiritual, driving, empty, vacuumous void inside every heart that can only ever be satisfied by Jesus not by the pursuits that the world offers, not by the temporary fillers that the world says will do it. They never permanently fill the empty place. Amen. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Verses 52 to 53. Then the people began arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They asked. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. Let me say this right now. This is talking about really partaking of Jesus, who he is, what he stands for, how he lived, taking on his attitude, understanding that you're a child of God and you have many rights and privileges. But like Jesus, to fulfill your assignment or assignments in life, you're prepared to forego a lot of that and you are prepared to have your body put on the line, whether it be broken in persecution or broken before God in prayer or just being hard on your flesh, getting up when it wants to stay in bed, praying for hours, getting to church early, setting up, playing music, whatever it is you do, going out to people where you're uncomfortable and out of your comfort zone, avoiding a night of television to go out to home group. There are a lot of ways in which our flesh is put on the line, but this is what we take in when you take in Jesus. You take in his word, his promises, all of the great things he has for us, his provision, his love, his comfort, his energy, his supernatural help, his healing, but also who he is and what he stands for. That's what this is talking about. You've got to take the whole package. Amen. So the third point today is signs and symbols today. I'm talking about the communion emblems for us are a symbol and also that there's signs coming. First, there's going to be lots of God's supernatural interventions on earth coming in the immediate future. And these are signs that point to God. Let's read this from Acts chapter 2, verses 17 to 21, where he was talking about days in which we live. In the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. There's one. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And in those days, I'll pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike. They will prophesy and I will cause wonders in heaven above, signs on the earth beneath, blood, fire, clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red. There's 10 things I just read in that scripture that are going to be signs of God at work. There's going to be signs that make people wonder. Signs that show God is doing something. People at the moment may think there is no God. Where is he? Where's his intervention? They said that about God just before Pharaoh's army died in the water. They thought that the enemy had them. But then suddenly all of Pharaoh's army, the greatest military on earth at that time, was completely annihilated, neutralized. They could never come after God's people again. And then he goes on to say, but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
Let's go through it again. Today's signs include prophecy, vision, dreams, blood, fire, smoke, sun darkened, blood red moon, which we've had a few of lately, and salvations. Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. So that's today's signs. Today's symbols, of course, are in these communion emblems that we can have every day. Rosanna and I receive these communion emblems just by ourselves at home every day. Every day we take it. And we know we're looking at the emblem or the symbol of Jesus' body and we break it. Understanding that we're part of that brokenness. Every day we take a symbol of Jesus' blood and we drink it, knowing that we are partaking of all of the good aspects of this, as well as the identification with his death, burial, resurrection, and his sacrificial life, because we live as a living sacrifice through the renewing of our mind. Amen. This is very important. Let's read it the way Jesus gave it to the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. For I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Amen. Now, in a few moments, Rosanna and I are going to receive these emblems together and we're asking you to join us. If you need to stop the broadcast right now and get your emblems together, that's good. But first of all, I just want to talk to people that maybe haven't yet received Jesus as their Saviour. We read it in that scripture that those that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you haven't had that experience yet, you'll know it. You might be saying to me, oh, I'm not sure if I have or not. That's just like saying, oh, I'm not sure if I've been married or not. No, if you've been married, you would know about it. That's not to comment on your current marital status. But if you got married once, you certainly know you did it. And it's the same as this. If you've been born again, you will certainly know that you've received the salvation Jesus offers. So if you're not sure, then please say this prayer with me today. And remember, you say it to God with all of your heart. You mean every word of it. It's based on the fact that Jesus died on the cross for you and that he rose from the dead, proving your sin was paid for. And if you believe in his resurrection, receive Jesus and then receive his new birth, his Holy Spirit, and then walk in his footsteps, declaring he is your Lord and following him, you will be saved. Doing what I've been talking about as well. Amen. So let's pray this prayer together today. Remember to say it to God and to mean it sincerely. Repeat this after me. Jesus, you say that, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I turn from my old life. Thank you for taking up my sin, paying the full consequence, and rising from the dead to show that they are forgiven. Today, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Saviour. I confess you are now my Lord. I receive your new birth and your Holy Spirit. Thank you that my name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. And by your grace, I will follow you from this point forward. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you pray that prayer today, I believe you've been born again. The next step is to tell somebody, but keep confessing that Jesus is Lord. You see someone that's a Christian and they don't know you are, you say, praise the Lord. (laughs) Jesus is Lord. But you keep declaring Jesus is Lord. 
you follow him, you read the Bible, you pray every day, and you grow in a relationship with Jesus. And also, whenever there's the opportunity, you receive the communion emblems, which you can do with Rosanna and I in a few moments. But first, what did we look at today? What did we learn? What's the conclusion? What can we learn from God's signs and symbols about eternal fulfillment? Number one, signs and symbols at Jesus' birth. Remember, it was God's sign of the Saviour, Christ and Lord being born. And Jesus' birthplace was a symbol, the bread of life, born in a feeding trough in the town of Bread House. All symbolic place where the sacrificial lambs were because he was destined not only to show us what God's like, but to die in our place. Number two, we looked at the signs and symbols of Jesus' ministry, all pointing to him as the Saviour, as the Lord and the Christ. But the symbol of bread multiplication led on to the discussion about what was the true bread from heaven. And we learned that Jesus is the true bread from heaven because he is the living word. And as we come to him and as we listen to him, we can get the bread of life ingested into our spiritual being. We can drink in the water of life and have it in us like a well of water that springs up to eternal life. This is an ongoing daily process. And we looked at the signs and symbols today, the signs that are about to take place on earth by God's miraculous intervention and also the symbols today when we take the communion emblems of the broken bread, the juice that represents Jesus' blood. They're emblems of what takes place in the Spirit every day where we enjoy fellowship with Jesus. We take that bread saying that we are receiving of the bread, the Word of God open to us. We drink the juice saying we are drinking in everything about Jesus, who he is, what he's done for us, but also walking in the same spirit with the same attitude. Well, God bless you today. Thank you so much for listening. Can I pray for you? Father, I pray for everybody today that you would draw each one of us at this Christmas time closer and closer to you that we may receive more and more of your glory and fullness in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now it's time on the online service to receive communion. If you haven't got your emblems yet, then quickly pause the play and get the emblems. But right now we're going to pray over these communion emblems and receive them together. Father, we thank Mm. you so much for the precious blood and body of Jesus. Uh, Jesus was born all those years ago as we celebrate at Christmas, but he was born placed in a manger where the sacrificial lambs are, And when he grew up to be 30-something years old, he was destined to die on the cross for our sins. And as we take these communion emblems today, we take this piece of bread. We thank you, Jesus, that by your stripes we were healed. Your body was broken for us, and we partake of this fully in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for the blood and the body of Jesus. In like manner, after supper, he took the cup. Mm. And he said, this cup is a covenant. It's the new covenant in the blood of Jesus. And as we take this today, we remember that his blood was shed to pay for our sins, to set up the new covenant, but also for us to remember that as we drink it, we receive everything he died to provide for us. We have a new identity in him, but we are also of the same spirit that caused him to live in such a way that he was obedient to the point of death. And so we deny self, we take up the cross, and we follow Jesus. Let's drink together for our forgiveness and the ongoing life in Jesus. Amen. We want to thank you so much for joining us in the service today. Thank you for watching. And we pray that you have a wonderful, wonderful Christmas season. Have an awesome day and week ahead. 
continue to connect with Jesus because he loves you so much. So from Dave and Rosanna on the Eternity Online service, until we see you next week, which will be the new year, right now from us, it's... Bye. Bye. Oh, come let